why are they going to invest the money? Uh, you know, why are they going to invest the money toward the latest, most advanced healthcare in the world for the miracle drugs? You have health, me uh, uh, medicine, the science of medicine is exploding with what they can do now. I won't even go into it all because it's it's like so uh, amazing. But the government is, is is destroying any incentive to take advantage of that. So you know, they may have the human genome pro project. They may be able to treat your genes before you even get sick. But nobody's going to put the billions of dollars into it that's necessary to develop that health care. So you're going to do it out. So instead of being the richest society in the world, you're going to fall behind. Let me just give you another example of how we're falling behind. Okay? Every once in a while, Obama says, yeah, okay, we're going to build more nuclear power plants. How many nuclear power plants are under construction in America? Zero. Zero. Okay. How many nuclear power plants are under construction in China? Twenty. How many nuclear power plants are under construction around the world? Thirty, including Sri Lanka. In America, zero. Sri Lanka, one. China, 20. America, zero. Okay, so we're falling behind. They are able to create a nuclear device, a nuclear battery. Uh, this is what's on the horizon. You talk about the science. Right, you're talking about the science. What's on the, the, uh, uh, what is on the horizon is the ability to create a nuclear battery for your car, which means you'll never have to drive into a gas station because it lasts 10 years. Uh, uh, how do we know that will work? Well, they've been having They've had it with submarines for 50 years. They, 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 they power our, our, our nuclear aircraft, our aircraft carriers with that now. And, and now the, the science on the edges, we're, we have portable, small uh, nuclear power plants that can be put underground that can power 20,000 homes. But they can make them small enough, they can put one in your car. Uh, and these guys have been living in these submarines under, under the ocean for months at a time, uh, living next to these nuclear power plants that are powering their subs, they come back, they don't come out of streaks. They, they're perfectly fine, they're perfectly healthy. So again, we're falling behind because the rest of the world is not gonna wait for us. If we don't wanna build it because the guy from the Sierra Club is scared, they're gonna go ahead and build it in China. So whatever, you guys, you just do whatever you want there in America. So are we gonna listen to these people? Are we gonna let them trash our country? Are we gonna let them trash our prosperity? Well, that's what we're doing today. And so uh, you guys are the only folks that are really fighting it. So, uh, I'm not sure I answered the whole question. Well, you said the future of Obamacare. How do we stop it as a second? How do you stop it? <laughs> well, you know, in, in chapter four of my book, I talk about how to repeal and replace it with patient power. And we go through all the patient power, where the patient is circulated, the surface choice is all put around the patient. What's your health insurance? Whether you're on Medicare, whether you're on Medicaid, whether you have employer-provided insurance, you get all the choices. You get to decide what your health insurance is. You get to decide what your doctor is. You get to decide what your health care is. Uh, and that, because you will have the incentives to, uh, to weigh costs against benefits, that will actually control costs at the same time and gives the power to the patient. And it's like health savings accounts, which is something, that, you know, I can go into that, but uh, if somebody wants to, but that's something to look up, study what health savings accounts are all about and how that was a booming area of the economy that was the, of the health economy that was benefiting everybody. But, you know, but, you know, these Obama and his people, it's not just Obama, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, I think it's today, it says, look, it's not just Obama, it's the Democrat Party believes this in their heart and soul. Uh, they wanted, they, they, because in the 1930s they believed that you had to have government bureaucracy run health care, that's the last time any of them really had the Lincoln Lights the Democrat Party had an idea. So they want, they, they're stuck there. And, and they're insistent that they've got to do that, what was thought the new hot idea in the 1930s. Other countries have done it, they tried it, it failed, it didn't work. That doesn't change anybody's mind. In my book, I talk about Detroit as an example, where they had every liberal policy in the world. Detroit's been run by liberals for 50 years. In 1950s, Detroit had the highest per capita income in America, 1.8 million citizens. Okay, today it's down to 800,000. They're the 66th uh, per, per capita income in the country. Okay, they're disappearing. Half the housing stock is a baby. We're talking about what are we going to do with these houses? Guess what? No, but the people aren't coming back, so I guess we've got to destroy these houses. What does that mean? The city is disappearing under these liberal policies. But they don't change. They, they, they don't, they don't, they haven't said, well, gee, maybe what we're doing is not working. That, that hasn't, you know, dawned on them. So you've got to get out and make them change. And maybe in a situation like Detroit, the, uh, the, the politics is gone until, you know, but uh, if you do, if you, if you, in other cities and other states, you adopt the policies and that work, then eventually they'll say, well, why should we be going back to the third? Why should I? You know, otherwise, Detroit may just entirely disappear. I say in the book, on um, their current course, they'll be down to one person, and he'll be a member, ask me. He'll be a lifelong Democrat, he'll be a liberal, 
to elect himself mayor at the last election, one vote, 100% vote, I vote for myself. He'll say he'll, he'll raise taxes to balance the budget. <laughs> then he'll leave Detroit. He says, I can't afford to pay these taxes. You started you started by the question a little bit. Um, are we already in a position where we essentially need a birth of a new industry to turn a ship around? In other words, if we start tapping and getting into energy and independence. Is this something that could help to turn the ship around? Absolutely. I mean, look, the truth is they don't want you to know the truth, but we have enough resources actually uh, to be the world's number one oil producer, the world's number one coal producer, the world's number one natural gas producer, the world's number one nuclear power producer. And if any of that wind and solar stuff ever works, we could be the number one in those too. Uh, but the government says no, you can't do it. The government says no, you can't do it. But just directly, all the people they would hire if you just threw open the doors and said, okay, you can produce now, offshore, onshore. They said, okay, the National Petroleum Reserve, we'll let you actually drill in the National Petroleum Reserve now. Uh, all the jobs they would create, hiring people just to do that. All the jobs they would create, uh, just building the power plants, building the new refineries, uh, just directly. Not to mention the fact that it would be a huge tax cut for the American economy because uh, what makes the economy boom is a reliable supply of low-cost energy. It's like a huge tax cut. All manufacturing is based on that. So, boom. If you just did the Reaganomics policy, again, again which I described in my book, you'd create another 25-year economic boom. We would be far and away the richest country in the world again. We'd leapfrog over them. The scientists there waiting, knocking on the door, and we're like, go away. We don't want to know. We want to go back to the economic death, dark ages. Uh, that's the current situation. you got to get out and get people to understand Reagan. Yes? i got to actually almost the facts. Uh, but go First of all, uh, relative to energy independence, I think one of the things that we really need to do is to look to Trenton because uh, they're not doing an awful lot in terms of uh, uh, allowing us to use all forms of energy right there in Trenton. If you take a look at the, the policies of the Democratic Party of the Democratic Party and Governor Christie, uh, it ain't real good to have uh, uh, energy independence in New Jersey, okay? That said, okay, political thing. Three things, uh, one short term, one long term, and one conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theory is I'm afraid that they're gonna come and confiscate my gold. Short term, what about the debt limit? And long term, what about the fair tax? Well, you know, uh, I read my book, I'm an advocate of 15% flat tax. Uh, I think that would be the best. What I have advocated at the state level is abolishing all state income taxes. There's nine states that have no state income tax, including big, successful states like Texas and Florida, medium states like Tennessee and Washington. Uh, you don't have to have a state income tax. And I explain how to phase it out. You put a, a limit on spending growth, uh, like they have in Colorado, a taxpayer bill of rights, limit spending growth to the rate of inflation and population. Uh, and in less than 10 years, you can phase out your state income tax entirely. They cut, uh, actually they did it in this state, when uh, Christine Todd Whitman was the governor, she cut the rates by 30% using that uh, system. Uh, then they gave up and, and whatever they got. After she did that, that, then she went back to being a liberal. But, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, but I mean, so what I advocate in the book is phase out state income taxes and then do a 15% flat tax and then for the payroll tax, what I advocate them because replacing, can't do this overnight, it actually would take decades to do all these entire reforms, but they're designed so that nobody gets hurt. But over decades, uh, you replace the entire payroll tax with a personal savings and investment account. So just think about what a difference that would make. Instead of, for most people, the biggest tax they pay is the payroll tax. They, in fact, they pay twice what they think they pay because the employer pays half of it for them. <coughs> So instead of that money going to the government and taxes, it's going into your own personal savings and investment. Not just you, but everybody in America is saving and investing. Now, I have the numbers in the book, but I've been writing these numbers, publishing these numbers for 20 years. If you said to the average tour couple, you can save and invest what otherwise is going into payroll taxes, it would come to close to a million dollars in standard long-term uh, market investment returns by the time you retire. Uh, so I mean, this is like, this is for average to earn a couple. So I mean, and also this process for lower income people. So you're saying to every lower income person, you will accumulate some hundred thousand dollars by your retirement. And uh, that will pay more on the interest alone than Social Security even promises you, let alone what you pay. And you can leave 
the money to your kids. Now, does that transformation or what? I mean, first of all, all that savings investment is going to the economy today, so that's raising everybody's wages, everybody's economic growth today. But then in the future, everybody becomes, uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, a cushion of capital supporting every family in America. And what does that mean socially? What does that mean politically? It means that instead of capital versus labor, everybody's a capitalist as well as a worker. So there's no longer labor versus capital. You're the capital as well as the labor. So then, uh, so then you create a socially productive farm. I also talk about in the book about new labor, and we need a new labor movement of real blue collar people. The current labor unions are run by these neo Marxist, quasi pseudo intellectual philosophers. Uh, and uh, so they're all about social revolution. But uh, unions, therefore, blue collar working people can be very productive for forces. Uh, but there needs to be a revolution. The blue collar workers actually need to take over their unions. I talk about that in the book. Too. I was talking about the new civil rights in the book. Uh, but, uh, uh, the what? Well, yeah, yeah, the debt limit is coming, is coming up. Well, they all exactly have a price for raising the debt limit. I mean, uh, 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 and I don't know how heavy a price they're going to be able to exact for it because you got to do it before you get to the debt limit. Uh, so, you know, you've got Ryan's budget coming in uh, April. And I'm looking to that to be a big factor. In March, you'll have the debt limit, and they need to do something serious with the debt limit. And you'll have all these histrionics going around. But you got to be part of the solution and spreading the word to your people. Every Wednesday morning, as he suggested, I have an article at spectator.org. I got a new comment at Forbes. That's supposed to appear every Thursday, Forbes.com. A couple of weeks ago, I tagged an article about sending welfare back to the states. Uh, the one this Thursday is going to be about abolishing state income taxes. Um, but spread those around, spread that word around. The Wall Street Journal editorial page is the best damn thing that's published every day. Uh, and uh, uh, now, if you want my advice, you know, if you send a dollar to the New York Times, you might as well just send it straight to the DNC. Buy the Wall Street Journal, read the editorial page. Uh, because you read about stuff there two years before you read about it anywhere else. Uh, and, uh, and, and then spread the word to other people. Did you see this article, you know? And uh, you can be your own little Rush Lamar, your own little Glenn Beck, by just dealing with your own uh, uh, Rolodex, your own uh, address list, your own email list. I don't have a real solution on the debt limit in the short term. Should it be increased? In theory, no. It should not be increased. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yeah. Any order amount of um, public lands and parks and so forth um, have been seized by the government in fact, <coughs> Preservation. Is there any risk that you know if we get into such debt with China, that they may have them come after the shale oil and the Rockies and you know our, our rights and you know, the banks are Some of that's already going on. They're, They're already buying you know rights to uh, American oil. We don't want to produce it, so. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what they're doing also is if we default. Yeah. Uh, well, our public, our public resources. Uh, what we really should, the opportunity that's really there is the federal government owns way too much government land. It's a form of socialism. Yep. They own a majority of several states in the West. Uh, and, uh, you know, look, okay, preserve the national parks, preserve environmentally sensitive land, sell the rest, and use it to pay down the national debt. Uh, and that's trillions and trillions of dollars right there. Uh, and, uh, and we started talking about this during the Reagan administration. I was in the Reagan White House. Uh, and you know we were talking about implementing this, but of course we were denounced by the environmentalists and left wing extremists and, and the rest of it. But that should be on the agenda. That should be part of the Tea Party agenda. Sell that land to the people. Let the, let the people. I believe in public ownership by real people, not by governments. Yes, you have your hand. Have you looked at the period of the 1920s? That was another time when uh, I think it was uh, Coolidge and Hoover drastically cut the size of the government. And uh, we had a recession in 1920. It got us out of the recession, and we had one of the biggest expansion periods in, in our history during the 20s. And then, uh, and then Hoover and FDR came in, and we all know what happened then. Well, I mean, that is one of the uh, historical experiments that proves supply side economics, because that's what they in World War One they increased tax rates enormously. Uh, in the 20s, they cut the tax rates enormously. They got uh, when they cut those tax rates, revenues went booming, went insane. Uh, and uh, uh, and so it proved that they 
cut the tax rates, they got more revenue. Under President John F. Kennedy, they did the same thing. They cut the tax rates, they got more revenue. They didn't know what to do with it, it was coming in so fast. That was one of the reasons they adopted the war on poverty. They, uh, that's one of the reasons they adopted Medicare and Medicaid. Money was pouring in. Uh, they just had a tax cut. They actually should have just cut taxes again. But, uh, but you know, Kennedy understood it. That proves the Democrats can understand it. And so Kennedy did it at work. But again, that's down the memory hole. That's, we don't want to, uh, you know, uh, we don't want to hear about that. Uh, that worked as well. In 1981, the top 1% of, of income earners paid 17% of all income taxes, with top tax rates of 70%. Okay, Reagan cut the top tax rate all the way down to 28%. Uh, okay, they raised it a little bit after that, but still it was way down. By 2007, the top 1% paid 40% of all federal income taxes. They cut the rate dramatically. That the share of federal income taxes paid by the top 1% went from 17% up to 40% of all federal income taxes. So you cut the rate, economy booms, everybody prospers. <clears throat> but then, no, they, no, they, they don't want to hear about it. They, just, they refuse to even listen. Okay? They, uh, uh, they, they, we have a president who will not learn from experience. So you have all these experiences, he still wants to increase the rates. If he increases the rate and causes a recession, you'll have much less revenue than before. Okay, but you know, the top 1% of income earners now uh, pay more in federal income taxes than the bottom 95% combined. That's before all, all Obama's tax rate increases. He says we need to do this so the rich pay their fair share. The top 1% pay more federal income taxes than the bottom 95% combined. The top 3% pay more federal income taxes than the bottom 2000 than the bottom 97% combined. This is the IRS data, 2007 official IRS data. And President Obama and the Democrats say, the rich will pay their fair share. We gotta raise the tax rates higher so the rich will pay. So what's their fair share? I mean, the top 1% are paying more than 95% combined. Uh, I, you know, uh, what, what was this article? I guess it was published today in The Spectator. I, I talk about how there's, I think there's a possibility that these Somali pirates that they just picked up will show up as employees of the United States Treasury Department in the Office of Tax Policy. Okay, over here, you have a question. Right now, in fact, the CD rate is approximately one and a half percent for five-year CDs. How long do you think it would be before it might go up to say three and a half percent? It's inevitable they're going to go up. To three. That's the Fed's policy. The Fed's like got rock bottom interest rates, uh, to get, and and that is evidence of a very loose monetary policy. So what bubbles are being created? Is the stock market a bubble? Uh, what bubble or bubbles are they creating so that when they stop dumping all these dollars in the economy, uh, you know, is the dollar, some people are saying the dollar's a bubble. Even though the dollar's fallen, it's got this artificial level, it's in a bubble because of all, that's a reflection of the loose Fed monetary policy. Eventually the Fed is going to have to stop doing that or, the, the, or you'll have runaway inflation and you won't be able to buy anything with the dollar. Uh, so sooner or later they'll have to stop that and the interest rates will absorb sooner or later. But, uh, Buying a five-year bond now at one and a half percent, putting your money in a CD for one and a half percent for five years is probably a bad bet because uh, it's likely that interest rates will rise in the next five years. My, my question really was, how many years or months do you think the rate might go from a one and a half up two percent to three and a half percent? Well, you know, it's, you know, at least I can get the direction right. It's going to go up. Eventually, it's going to go up a lot. Uh, uh, you know, I can't give you a perfect timing. No, no, the reason why I was asking that, if the rate did increase to 3.5% on a CD, which still is a very small return based on the price increases at the path mark, and the mortgages went up 2% from 4 and 3 quarter to 6 and 3 quarter, a person who today qualifies for a $300,000 loan will immediately only qualify for $240,000 loan with the same monthly payment. It'll be $60,000 which means his purchasing power will drop by 20%, which means the vast amount of houses will immediately be under water, okay? And uh, which will make a major, also when rates start going up, only that 2% movement, when municipal bonds become due to be recast, there won't be any buyers. And towns like Clifton who lost their school aid looked at the opportunity to go bankrupt, but they couldn't because they weren't defaulting will take the opportunity to default just to renegotiate all their contracts. One of the problems is with rates being so low, the difference between 4% and 6% is 
is not two, but 50. Well, so as soon as we start seeing a movement like that, I don't know if we get a year or two or three, that's when all our purchasers will be able to nowhere near pay the remaining balances on the sellers' mortgages. And the uh, municipalities will be looking into going to go bankrupt because when their municipal bonds come due, there will be no purchases because they're waiting for the rates to go up even higher. That's an excellent example of why they call that monetary policy is called by the interest rates will go up when the Fed versus monetary policy. They use the word contractionary. That one example you gave about the, what happens to the ability to get a mortgage and then the housing prices is applied. The interest rates have that effect across the entire economy in every investor. Or should we build this plan or not? It means when it made sense at you know today when the interest rate goes up two points, it doesn't make sense. So they don't invest the money, they don't build the plant, they don't hire the people. So it's contractionary. And so when the interest rates go up, we'll have that contractionary effect. So this decision the Fed's making, well, do we you know tighten to you know save the dollar and, and stop inflation? And they're trying to make the decision, should we do that now in the summer? Do we want to go over the next 18 months with the higher interest rates having that effect all over the economy? And they're going, we can't do that. There's I was running for re-election in 2012. So, so what does that mean? That means they can't really. And then they can't do it in 2013 either because you have the tax rates. So how bad is the inflation going to get? So you know, the reason why you can't really answer that question as to when is when the Fed decides to ask it. And I don't run the Fed, so I can't tell you when they're going to do it. But if they don't do it, they're going to destroy the dollar and uh, they're going to have runaway inflation. And uh, you're already seeing that in the grocery stores that start to show up. They're trying to deny it. But it's already showing up, and uh, it's just going to get worse and worse. Yes, and I'll wait about it. Thank you very much. 